What I propose to do today is to describe how normal lectures are given. I will be discussing two of my talks in some of the previous offerings of CS101 at IIT Bombay. Uh, both the talks, the lecture sessions have been uploaded on the Moodle. You can download them and later on look at the more detailed slides. I will not go through the complete sessions for both the sessions, but I will rather concentrate on a few points just to share with you how we discuss things in a regular conventional classroom. So this was the overview of the complete session where we try to motivate the students to understand the need for an array. Then we describe how elements of an array are accessed using index expressions and we also try and develop the algorithm for exchange sort or the bubble sort as it is known. In the same session we also indicate the notion of program efficiency which is generally not touched unless it is described as a separate topic somewhere. We talk of time complexity of algorithms and so on, which are complicated terms. But the simple thing like how long it takes to execute a program and what happens when the size of the execution data increases multifold. The same session also describes the CAR data types and the string of characters in conventional C programming, where you have an array which is a null delimited string uh, stored in that array. Finally, I will discuss the take home test, a copy of which is with you. That is how we conventionally evaluate people and I'll mention something about how we can use such sessions, redesign them and make them amenable for a flipped classroom kind of shorter videos, activities, etc., etc. As I said, I will not be going through all the slides here. The slides are there on the Moodle, you can look at them later. So basically, we say that you need to handle multiple values. And the, the problem is discussed in the context of identifying individual digits of a number. This is a standard problem that is given. But suppose a number is a nine digit number, then you will require variables like D1, D2, D3, D4, D5, D6, D7, etc., etc., and that is cumbersome. So this is a simple problem of reversing the digits, which people can understand. But it is difficult to use different variable names, and that is the motivation for an array. And we also remind people that in maths, the students generally are aware of two-dimensional arrays, which are called matrices in the conventional way. And they know of matrix addition, matrix subtraction, matrix multiplication, etc., etc. And later on in their engineering and science courses, at least, they will be dealing with matrix inverse, eigenvalues, whatever, whatever, other problems. So we introduce the notion of an array as it is known to the students by saying that often we may want to find out the sum of n elements of an array. The mathematical notation is indicated here. And suppose this is an array which contains some 11 integer values, we could write this as this. But if we use a notation xi to represent ith element, what is x2, what is x7? So you can say this is x2, this is x7. Please note conventionally students will be familiar with an index starting with 1 and going up to whatever else. We look at this array and say that now we will wish to rearrange the elements of x such that the following property is satisfied. This is deliberately included here as a mathematical formulation. You can easily see what that mathematical formulation means. It means that the array elements should be in descending order. The largest element should be at the beginning. Okay. So this is generally the motivation. And then we will tell them that, look, ideally we would like, just as we use a single name for an array in maths, we would like to actually use a single name for the collection, entire collection of data. And that is how we introduce the notion of a name of an array. 
and then we use the model this uh, model of uh, drawers in a cupboard to represent memory locations is part of my introduction to a computing model using what I call a Vudduran Dumbo. I will show you the, uh, the slide and the uh, video tomorrow morning for that. But essentially we say that if we were to use different variable names for individual elements, we'll run out of names and the names will not be very meaningful anyway. So we say that if we can make the compiler allocate consecutive memory locations for all 100 integer objects. By this time they know the variables as int and float and whatever, whatever. And then we sort of indicate that there is something called a base address and add four bytes to it, you get the next address, etc., etc. Remember, we are not talking about pointers at the juncture at all. We are merely suggesting that as the index of the array varies, effectively what varies is the address uh, pointing to different elements of the array. We describe how the arrays are defined and so on. We describe the important properties of arrays. We describe what an index expression is. And we say that we will use this A square bracket I to indicate I as an index, etc., etc. And then we describe in a pictorial form how the array elements will be put one after another, where each location can hold, let us say, a particular type int value or float value or what. Okay. So these are the kind of array declarations that you can have. We say this is incorrect. Please note, by this time we have not actually described define and size, etc., etc. So people might think that they can declare a variable size array by reading in the value of n size. It is important to dispel that notion and tell them that the array size ordinarily has to be prescribed before uh, or when you write the program. And then there are some additional examples of indexing, limits on index value, the fact that index varies from 0 to size minus 1, etc., etc., etc. Now, this is where we start motivating people to the notion of sorting. So to begin with, since we would have discussed a problem to find out the maximum of n numbers or minimum of n numbers, you will recall it was one of the exercises uh, of how to find out the maximum of two numbers. And there were two options given. One was using the if then else and the other was presupposing that one element is the largest and then comparing with the next. And we say that this is how we can find the maximum of n numbers. You read out all the n numbers first, assume that the zeroth element is maximum and then compare that maximum with all other elements. If any other element is larger than the current max, you reset the max. This is very simple for people to understand. But now what you say is that you also want to find out where the position occurs for that maximum. We of course might suggest that either all integers in the array should be unique or if there are multiple integer values which are same as the maximum value, then this algorithm will either point to the first or the last element. Okay, but later on we'll clarify that it does not really matter. So this is how we introduce an additional variable called position. It is deliberately described separately to indicate that it is an important variable. And then as you find the max, you also find the position. This is quite simple for people to understand. But now we motivate them by telling them that if I swap the values of two locations of an array, uh, I have left this slide blank. What I do is I use the tablet to indicate the swapping of array elements which is very similar to swapping of two variables ordinarily, except that the elements participate in the swap. And using that, I say, suppose I decide that I find the maximum in an array and exchange it with this zeroth element of the array. How would I do that? Well, the algorithm runs exactly as it is for finding out the max and its position. And after it has found the maximum and its position, I will simply exchange that element with A0. So A0 is assigned A pos, before that A0 is stored in a temporary variable, and then temp is assigned to A pos. This exchanges the maximum element found with the A0 ethylene. And then of course the program simply prints that value. People wonder why we are doing this crazy thing. There is an array, there are elements, we are taking out one element which is the maximum and exchanging it with the 0 ethylene. This is actually the motivation for explaining the 
exchange salt. So he says, suppose we had six elements in the array. It would be nice if I could demonstrate this finding out the maximum also dynamically. There are animations which are possible. There are animations which are possible in code blocks, incidentally, where people can go through that execution. And for a few elements, people can see that. But more importantly, it is sufficient to tell them that after executing the program, the max will be found at 95 and its position would be 3, 0, 1, 2, 3. And when we exchange, this is how the array will look like. Now we tell them that we have the largest element at the 0th position. Suppose we ignore that and look at the remainder of the array. And we repeat exactly the same process for remaining 5 elements which are 52, 13, 24, 64, 50. What would happen now is 64 will come here and 52 will go in its place. Now we notice that the array will now contain 95, 64 and then the remaining element. At this time you can ask the question to the people, if we continue this process for all the remaining elements, what would happen? And 99% of the people can guess that at the end, the array would be arranged in this sorted order. Then you can tell them that, look, the program that we wrote to find out the maximum in its position and exchange that element with the zeroth element can most easily be extended to do the entire sorting. And then we present this program to them that here is an array. We read n elements into it. We set up an iteration for k equal to 0 to n minus 1. And Instead of 0th element, we now consider kth element to be the anchor. So from kth element onwards, we examine all the remaining elements, find out the max, exchange it with the kth element here. So notice that in the previous program, whatever was a0 now is ak, and there is an internal iteration which runs through this. And when I do that, when I exchange it with this, I will just print out all the elements of an array and I will get a sorted array. Now, this kind of introduction to sorting, you can use your own technique to explain. What typically happens is we go by the book and take the bubble sort or any such example which is given there. But it might be useful to motivate people towards bubble sort with this or any other similar example, which will uh, tell them exactly why we are doing those things. Now, here is a practical example. Let's suppose I have a class of 500 students. I have given an exam. I have collected the marks. And I have roll numbers of students and marks of the students stored into arrays. And I want to find out who are the top 10 performers in the class. Then one simple way would be to read those two uh, quantities about every student, the roll number and marks, in two arrays. Naturally, these two are different arrays. So when we sort an array on marks, we will have to correspondingly sort the roll number array so that whenever marks of a student move within an array, the corresponding movement happens for the roll number L. And we can tell them it's so easy to do that whenever you change, you, you shift, this, this is of course just the input statement. Okay, please note an indication that if the number of elements supplied to you or assumed to be supplied to you, that is the number N, is larger than the array limit, you actually print out an error message and say, this is not correct. All of you will know that return 1, any return, non-zero return can be flagged by the operating system later for your purposes. So that is a, a good programming practice. That's what you can tell people. Anyway, the point being made is that in my algorithm, which is exactly the same program as the previous one, the only difference is that whenever I find the maximum, I not only exchange the maximum marks with the kth element, I also exchange the kth roll number. That's the only extension that is required. And then I comment that both arrays are now sorted on marks and output first 10 elements. This is deliberately done to later on tell them that this is not probably the most exemplary way of finding out the 10 best people. For example, if you were to find the top two people, you won't sort the entire array of 1,000 people. You'll just find out max one, max two. Okay. In fact, it is an interesting mathematical problem to determine that if you have to find the kth maximum or the first k maximums in an array, then what is the value of k for which 
sorting of the entire array is more beneficial versus using some other approach. It's a hard mathematical problem. Okay. This you can pose to the better performing students of the class. But this is one way of indicating that don't think too much, sort the array, find out the top 10, your job is done. This is where I used an opportunity to introduce the notion of efficiency of our program in terms of the execution time. So I observed that most programs typically get executed in less than a second. And therefore we don't bother about how much time a program takes to execute. Because 50 milliseconds and 700 milliseconds the 700 milliseconds is 12, 14 times 50 milliseconds, but both of them are unobservable by us. We press return and the program executes, so we don't get to see it. However, if there are large numbers, then the program execution may take time. And this is where you can introduce an appropriate command at the operating system level, which will monitor the execution time when the program is executed. For example, in Unix operating systems, you have typically a time command which will tell you the real time, that is the clock time that it takes to execute, the user time and the system time. So on that particular PC, when I executed this, it took about eight seconds of real time because of variety of other things, the machine was doing other things as well. But the more important point, uh, time point is the user time, that is the time that the processor spends on executing your algorithm. It, two seconds is sizable. The question to be asked, are two questions on this point itself. First, this was a thousand element array and n was let us say 100 or 200 or whatever. What if the number of elements were 10,000? Okay. What if the number of elements are 100,000? Will the number increase from 2 to 10 times 2 to 100 times 2? You know all the answer is no. Because the algorithm that we use the order of time complexity is n square. So two seconds will become four seconds and four seconds will become 16 seconds. And you should encourage students to run such programs with larger data. Correspondingly, there is a second question. How do I input 1000 values? How do I input 100 values even? How do I input 10,000 values? This is where you can motivate them to think about data generation. So for example, since this is only a hypothetical exercise, I can tell the students that how does it matter if the roll numbers are 1 lakh 1, 1 lakh 2, 1 lakh 3, 1 lakh 4, 1 lakh 5, etc, etc. And the marks are 1 lakh 1, 1 lakh 2, 1 lakh 3, 1 lakh 4, modulo 100. Then, they will suddenly realize that they don't need an input statement at all. They could actually declare two large array, take any n, and automatically fill up as many values they desire in the roll number array as well as in marks array. Of course, this is artificial data. But we can tell them the objective here is to understand the efficiency of the program that we write. And the objective also to tell people that when they execute this with real data, then these are the kind of timing that it is likely to take. We have a lab exercise later where we give them a sample code of generation of data and we ask them to write different sort algorithms and compare the execution time. Uh, instead of my own experience is that instead of giving them the time complexity and the detailed analysis, if you ask them to actually execute that program with different values of n, n is 100, 1000, 10,000, 1 lakh, etc., etc. And when they see actually a program taking as long as two minutes, for example, sometime, they realize there is something wrong with the approach of sorting. And that becomes a motivation to introduce other sorting techniques, including at the end the quick sort, if that is included in your deliberations. So we have found time and again that such approach is more conducive for students to understand. In fact, uh, we spoke of average students yesterday. So as I told you, we all of us have the average student in mind. And for average student, these kind of approaches prove better than the smarter students. Smarter students will understand areas any which way. They will understand these algorithm very quickly. So you have to hold them for some time till everybody in the class understands these things. Okay. 
later on in this session i discussed the char data type and the uh, character as an array and i take a problem which is uh, first i describe the classical representation of string when i say c++ for example that is exactly the same as a c string okay and then i describe that if i if i want to uh, look at the internal representation it will be a null delimited character string and exactly how do i handle words or strings etc etc there is another problem of finding the reverse of a string and then there is an example suppose i have written this program on the face of it it looks correct if i give it a five character string the program appears to work correctly so i execute the program actually and show them what the execution results are but then immediately show that if the input string is say for example nagesh the program doesn't work properly and why it doesn't work properly is because i am not running the loop appropriately re uh, remaining at the center and then uh, because of the integer division i get the middle point wrong if the number of uh, elements are even and then i tell them what should be the correct uh, uh, program this is a simple example to tell people uh, how a, a simple mistake could watch up the entire approach and the program but this is not important i wanted to show only the so this then then we show the corrected program and so on now i come to the important point usually we have this continuous evaluation but continuous evaluation in the classical sense before we started using this is about 4 years ago when the moodle had just started becoming practical and just was getting uh, included in larger courses also the moodle also had performance problems then at that time it was still fashionable to conduct a paper and pencil quiz and test you can you can read the question paper but let me explain the motivation behind the test and the way it was conducted traditionally we have a mid sem examination and an end sem examination most of you would have similar pattern in between we have two quizzes which are held before the mid sem and after the mid sem so these quizzes the lab assignments the mid sem marks and the end sem marks plus the project marks together make the total grade of the student the quizzes and the tests are conducted on paper or they used to be conducted on paper this will be the first time when we will be conducting all exams online now <clears throat> this is an important mechanism for a teacher also to get a feedback of how well the students have understood things so typically a quiz is conducted in a regular classroom with a supervised fashion but i thought i will like to give the students an idea of what kind of quiz would be conducted when they come for the one hour quiz so what i did is i gave them a take home quiz so this this quiz is actually given away to the students this is a take home quiz slides for that session the last two two slides describe the nature of the take home test so it says take this paper back home take some a4 sheets start a watch whenever you decide to write this test it's an open book test but when you attempt the test paper you will not consult with anybody you will do your own exercise suppose you leave the paper you are in the hostel room or at home and some emergency comes in after half an hour you note down after half an hour you left for 15 minutes 20 minutes half an hour when you come back you again point try to finish in one hour whatever you can whenever the one hour clock ticks draw a line that you have done only this much up to one hour and then complete the papers please note that one of the problems which students face in the conventional examination is an uncanny tension of completing that job in that stipulated time and different students as you all know will take this tension differently some people will get completely depressed if they start losing time some people will be very methodical some people will be arbitrary in their time management it is a great level that i have found when you give this a take home test and tell them to monitor themselves agreeably not all students will do that properly okay as it happens in a class you know some people are attentive some people are less attentive but all those who attempt it in this fashion have confessed 
that they benefited tremendously and they learned by that exercise. They learned to discipline themselves in time, etc., etc. The statement in that slide also says, after you complete it, then look at the sample answers given and evaluate yourself. Give marks to yourself. And one more, after evaluating yourself, discuss your answers and score with your friends. Find out what is the correct answer. You see, the crowdsourcing need not only be formally done for 10,000 people. It can be very informally done even for 100 people. Each person finds one's own crowd because each person will have three, four, five friends. And they, if they are interested, they will do this kind of thing. More importantly, they are required to submit the handwritten papers. When they submit the handwritten papers, we don't even have to examine the papers. We look at the scores. It is unbelievable that 95% of the students don't cheat when they hand over those papers back. The scores are actually what they have scored. Although subsequently they have found the correct solution. And you know why? They know that these marks are not going to be counted towards examination. So they don't need to cheat. 5% people cheat because either they have very low scores or they want to establish the better performers also cheat. They want to show that they have scored 100% marks. But ignore those. Majority of these students benefit from such exercise. Now I come to the flip classroom part of how to apply this in a regular session. What if this entire session, this was a one and a half hour session by you. What if I split this one and a half hour session into three sessions of half an hour each with some sample exercises given along with a video recorded lecture. I have three lecture sessions in a week, which I typically have three hour sessions or something like that. Okay. I could get these, one of these sessions to say, please look at these videos, solve these exercises and come to the class to discuss the problem. And I would rather give a variation of the sorting problem or something like that as a tutorial problem in the class and discuss that problem. When I discuss the string handling, I could give additional problem sets for tutorial discussion in the class after the students have viewed the original portion describing how the character strings are handled. It is easily possible to take a one hour lecture, record your lecture, dub your voice, give your examples, upload it on Moodle and tell students that watch this video before coming here and you now use the classroom. So whatever the test and quizzes that we are giving, even as a regular assessment, instead of that, we can give similar quizzes in the regular classroom during the discussion session. That is flipping. Flipping is not something arbitrary or something different. You are merely expanding on the lecture in a physical face-to-face -face contact, an opportunity which otherwise we will normally not get. As I mentioned, if you have three hours in a week or four hours in a week for a course, most of the time we'll spend in lecturing. And a lecture pre-prepared is as good as your normal lecture. You are compensating for the lack of physical presence in that lecture when the students view your lecture in their hostel room or home. You are compensating for it more than by physically interacting with them during the regular lecture. The trick is, how do you take a one-hour lecture material plus the problems that you would like the students to solve at home together and recompose it into smaller video lectures which people can see at home and all the problems including take-home quizzes, etc., etc., discussed in the class. And over and above that, you can actually give them some additional take-home exercises for practice if they wish. This was in 2010-2011. Subsequently, when we tried to run a flipped classroom model, we found that we were able to discuss many more problems in face-to-face -face interaction and the students' performance in the regular tests and quizzes, overall performance increased. There is no evidence to indicate that suddenly smarter students have started coming to IIT in the last four years. So the average capability and preparation level is same. You would have also observed the same thing. If at all anything, in fact, there is a crib 
that the level of students preparedness is actually going down but what we found is that their scores in the exams the formal exams were better on an average than what the scores were earlier so this has actually convinced us that the flipped classroom model will work but it requires lot of work on our part such as for this cs101 i will be doing all this work together with help from you and together with help from 10000 people that is the model i yesterday professor abhiram ranade spoke about motivating students using interesting examples of graphics and image processing we used that in one of the sessions in previous years to introduce people to the use of a matrix for representing images and this led to an ultimate discussion on fingerprints and a large number of projects that year were done on the aadhaar related authentication of fingerprints building a database of all people etc etc and the entire set of students actually worked in different teams to do very interesting jobs including actual image analysis which is done by advanced students of image analysis undergrad students of first year are capable of doing that we need to actually tempt them to exercise arguably not all students will do that kind of work there are only few who will venture into understanding the underlying mathematics and implement the algorithms and so on but most will end up doing some part of the larger portion and they will enjoy doing that small part because they are doing part of a larger problem that is one advantage of related course projects being given i will mention about that when i discuss this